it's of course a honor for me here to speak in this, uh, at this symposium, the 26 CX symposium. I'm also vice president uh, for organic agriculture in CX, so that is even for me an institution with a long history. And I know that you are all friends of Ewald and Silvia, that you come here to at least celebrate a history of many decades here for this topic of fertilization and CIEC. And uh, Ewald and Silvia were both the guys who have brought organic into this discussion. And that's very important. Because very often, on the one side, organic has thought nutrition and fertilizers are bad. It's not necessary. God is given. And on the other side, normal scientists very often thought organic agriculture is just about organic matter. So when I receive a lot of papers coming from all over the world, they always, many of them submitted because they have used some organic matter in their trials. So I must say, it's a little bit more. So, what you see here at the front is what follows me since 20 years, and you have already heard me, they have always to digest it again. There's nothing wrong about this after 20 years, and I have to repeat it, we have in agriculture more challenges than one disciplinary issue, like climate, biodiversity, and so on and so on. So when we do research for, for agriculture or the food chain, it is extremely necessary to not forget for whom we are doing this, and in which system do we do this? And the systems have all their challenges, they have all their expectations, their socio-economic frame conditions, their ecological frame conditions, and into these systems we have to put our qualification, knowledge and motivation. But I always ask scientists worldwide, are you able to make your own food on the limited resources of this earth on your own, then you are able to speak to a farmer or anyone who makes decisions about farming. If you are not able to do that, and just looking through a microscope, or just doing perfect papers, you have not delivered what the earth really needs. So that's my core message. Do it everywhere. You have read it. That was why it was before my real presentations. My speak is about plant nutrition in organic agriculture, but because Ulrich Köpke will speak after me, that's the first time I have this case, now usually he speaks before me, and then I have to make everything what he has left over, so now we have vice versa. So that's great for me, and in principle we can say it's all about soil fertility, and that is not just the nutrients into this issue. That's a worldwide issue, and it's everywhere different. And for everyone, it's a different topic how to address it. So I will come in principle here with my speak about general issues of plant nutrition and the challenges of the futures where organic at least can be one solution, not the solution. So when we come into policy discussions, global level, national level or local level, we always address first our challenges are heavy, and we can't ignore any system or any idea to solve them. And organic is part of it. It is part of it, like conventional farming, like GMO farming, like all oh, the urban agriculture. So we can't ignore any option to make future possible in a good manner. So for this, you see here, organic is a well-described system worldwide, in principle with four principles. The principles of health, well defined. What does it mean? Health is not just human health, animal health, it is health of the earth. Then we have ecology. That means we are addressing that ecology can't be ignored. And every farmer on the earth who is doing organic farming is signing a contract that he wants to work for ecology, including fairness. It's not written on the contracts, but fairness to anyone, to the earth, to the farmer, to the consumers, to the employees. Very difficult, nearly impossible to please anyone. Eh? Consumers want it cheap and enough. Farmer wants a lot of money and has no money for his stuff. And the question of caring, caring things, that we do it with a lot of care. In principle, we would say between knowledge, we know things, you are all scientists, you have this head brain and headaches, and we need skills, skills who utilize this knowledge, who utilize knowledge that we are able to put it down to practice, and we can't do it when we have no good attitude, motivation to do it. 
this so-called triangle of good application of innovations. And this is the frame what organic can deliver. And in principle, we have forced many governments now to going even a share of organic to at least have an option in their policy design. Not just following one track to avoid that there is a risk that this one track will be a wrong track. It's like a marathon. You have a long run, but you can run in the wrong direction. So the, I will not go through this slide, but it's just what I can tell you, and that is GSZ, the biggest German technical corporation unit with 2.5 billion euro turnover, who has even taken into their policy organic agriculture. It was not very easy. But the principle what they address here is a cycle approach. A cycle, we call it a negative cycle and a positive cycle. The negative cycle is the cycle of crashing hazards, risks, diseases can it be. It can be Ingredients in food, what we do not want to have, anything what is negative in a cycle. HACCP are concepts who are solving such problems, but we hope to crash cycles. Much more necessary in organics than in conventional farming. And on the other side, and that's a positive story, closing cycles. Very simple between plant and livestock and food and soil. So to bring back the understanding of an holistic approach that agriculture and the food chain is a system and not just one track. And you see worldwide the impact when you have forgotten this, monocultures, big input needed agricultural systems, mono diets and so on and so on, to stabilize under changing environments or changing socio-economical frame conditions, you need at least an understanding what is the cycle, what is the system, and how to influence it, that it will be a success in the future. Accepted. So, organic agriculture is not just an ideology. In the Western world, we can say clearly in, in research, it is okay. It is not the only solution, but it's accepted. We can publish, we can do experiments, we are respected and appreciated in our world. But worldwide, we must clearly say it is still considered as ideology, as non-valid for solving future problems, and at least as not productive or good enough. But when you see figures like here, this is a figure of farmland, we're talking about 50, uh, 70 million hectares worldwide. And 70 million hectares out of many more, about 5 billion hectares we have, it's a share of 1.6%. Uh, but nevertheless, 1.6% of the world agricultural share means that this strong, heavy concept is considered and in practice. Done by at least nearly 3 million organic farmers who have signed these principles and deliver an organic market who has a market value globally of more than 100 million US dollar, 92 euro and a billion euro. So this is even a big share with countries where they have already 80% of markets growth with 30% like in Denmark who have organic products in the final consumer share. In Germany it's about 5%. And we have countries like Switzerland where nearly 300 uh, euro per year per person is paid for organic products what you can't see in the product. The product conventional organic should be same. So they pay extra for promises. And this promise has an inspection and certification procedure from the production up to the final consumer with integrity proof, with traceability proof, and that is the most certified, checked, inspected food chain globally. Global gap, all the rest, forget it. It's not even 10% of that what you face with organic. So a lot of risk avoidance and at least pr approval for the final consumers is delivered in organic. And that makes it so attractive for blockchain approaches and so on. Coming to the plant nutrition. It's a very minor topic, despite soil fertility is the overall issue. We have here just organic farming, some elements from vermin compost up to uh, here crop rotation and animal husbandry. I will go through some of them. The first is here is from our experimental station. A very traditional, very simple point is the food manure chain. So the combination of crop production and livestock keeping. Globally, you see a lot of separation. There's the crop production, 
And there is the livestock production on the other side. So an integrated approach are very often not done. But if we have organic systems, you cannot really manage it well without livestock. Because of many reasons. First, if you have here the organic cropping here like grain, you have two problems. First is the nutrient problem. You need nutrients, what is not coming from the back. It is coming from the environment, at least from the air. So, and nitrogen, for example, is one impact. And you have weeds. Weeds as a problem coming, appearing after a couple of years. So with this management here of this example here, grass clover here, what is only digestible by ruminants, can solve these problems. First, the uh, legumes, they produce or do nitrogen fixation. And on the other side, with a lot of cuttings a year, you can make weed control. So enormous system impact. And we can, after two years, deliver enough nutrients to run uh, crop farming four years successfully. And then with a slowdown, of course. And then to again, starting again. In the same environment, you would have conventional systems of three crops, and you would need a lot of farm inputs to make this running. So this is a very principled approach that we have the link between livestock who utilize this grass clover, making milk or beef or anything, what you like, so that you have a farm income from such fields. So a farmer without livestock in organics uh, sector is extremely lacking nutrients or nutrient flows from one field to the other field. So a stable system can be only if you have a system who delivers both at least in networks of farms. It's not necessary that you do it all on your own. So then we talk at least about, and that is for the Demeter Association, a very important part. They have an obligation to have cattle on their farm. It's a special association in organic movement. And it's the oldest one. And they say, you have to have cattle. You have to have cattle with horns. That is a special issue. Eva did a lot of research on this and confirmed that this is absolutely research uh, from a research point of view valid, <laughs> all the miracles. But at least the message is the menu of cows is more important than the milk because this is our gold of our soils. With a lot of impact you know and a lot of problems you probably know how to make it. You keep cattle. That is not just an easy job. But this is the work, what we see here as a core element with all things are in. It is not just one, it's not balanced. But this is the instrument to make soil fertility with a long, short-term impact and at least the content of nutrients. And the other point is the composting. Composting was nearly forgotten 20, 30 years ago. Nowadays it's a core topic, like humus, like organic matter in the soils. It's all new in the climate change discussion, in the water discussion, in at least the soil fertility discussion from Science of plant nutrition, it was nearly not existing last millennium, and that is 20 years ago. So this composting was invented in organic agriculture, extremely sufficient, efficient, and at least well proved that it can deliver a lot of positive advantages for soil fertility and at least plant growth. Using bioengineers. This, this, you like this, bioengineers here, earthworms, earthworms who help us to digest it. So the environment as a biological functioning environments are relevant to organize the mobilization of nutrients, to keep it in the soil, to make it at least usable for our plant growth we want to have. Definitely we have a problem. We do soil mining. Phosphate is exported in the products. It is difficult to release these nutrients in the soil when you have grain production because of the pH. And you see here a picture that is bones are burned here to produce phosphate for small gardening here in Africa. So that this phosphate usually is coming from Morocco, coming from sources with contamination. I have heard, Ebert, is it correct, cadmium and uranium and some dioxin had created some problems for you, I remember. But this phosphate is at least where we see organic system is not a cycle system. We are a system who is not sustainable. A very important understanding that a farm internal cycle is not what is our system. The system is including the consumers, including the food chain out of farm. So coming to the point here, plans should be different, plants should be adapted to such systems here. You see it here in a picture where you have the same plant but with different uh, 
uh, here lengths and uh, densities of roots. And you see it here in convention, it will fertilize. Last year, when we had a severe drought in Germany on our experimental station, I was wondering why maize was still good. Uh, it was a condition, I would say, should be all dead. But the maize, as a high-qualified seed and variety, was able to go two and a half meters deep into the ground, while all the irrigated system in conventional systems, let's say somewhere, they were all more like this mood and were not able to, uh, to cope with such extreme conditions in our regions. So when you see this here, I could come to some comparisons. And you see here comparisons of two nice pictures. First, that is an organic picture, a holy approach, a nice landscape with a village, with small-scale farming, with people, with animals, with cropping. This is a principle of the European biggest association's bioland for organic. This is a vision they want to give farmers and consumers. There's where we want to go. And on the other side, you see here a vision that is a company of uh, dairy facilities for dairy, for milk production, Gea. Gea is a milking facility. They have here in the harbor of a big city that is here, for example, Rotterdam in uh, in Western Europe here, and they have here the dairy cows, all the food is coming in, the menu is going out, and this is an extreme industrialized production here. So these both pictures are driving forces in our research. Where shall we go? It's nothing about right or wrong in research. It's a question, which questions coming out of such systems? And we have to address them, which results can we deliver? For example, coming to glyphosate, it's a typical European discussion, worldwide appreciated. We can't say it's bad or good. We can say, what will the impact if it's bad? And for that, you need clear questions to make research possible, and that's never only just one answer. And you see here the result of organic here, that's still an old picture, but still valid, uh, that the yields in conventional still raising because of many reasons, it's not just plant nutrition, and organic not. So we call this, let's say, increasing gap doping. Doping with a lot of instruments, because our system without external impacts are not able to deliver such things. So this is a big problem. What is doping? Is it accepted doping or difficult doping? And this is a result where we must at least say, hmm, we are not happy about it. Change to next one. Coming to one of the systems, you have seen the plant and the livestock food and plant uh, cycles here. If you put it really into a graph here, you see a conventional farm. We did, Hans Martin, you are here, you are the research leader of this project here, where we have nutrients flows because it, you address it easily. But do it and measure it. It's very difficult between N2O and all what you have emissions coming into the soils. Then you have plant production, then you have flows via here the natural yields, or you have it here in losses in the farm and fertilizing and so on. And this is a conventional, let's say, chain, very simple chain. And you see here is a plus of 100 uh, kilogram per hectare nitrogen. This is an efficient system, a big output, proud farmers, and I still say I'm happy that we have such proud farmers because that is the frame conditions they work on, and they did it well. Coming to an organic system, you see much more complex integration of livestock, and we're coming here down to 9 kilograms per hectare nitrogen, and this is a big impact to all the areas where we have water catchment for tape water, or where we have a lot of loads of nitrates into groundwater, where we can at least say, even including livestock, because this is related, we can at least optimize systems with more complex approaches. Livestock is here integral part. But at least solutions for a point where we are not proud about. This should be low. It's very low here, it could be a little bit higher, but at least it is too high with 100 kg. Coming to an overall conclusion, it's even part of this project pilot uh, farms, where 80 pair, uh, paid paired farms were just organic conventionally side by side, same conditions throughout Germany. One organic farm, neighbor farm is a conventional farm, so same conditions here. And you see here from the nitrogen comparison that the N input is higher for conventional. That is the sign. The output is even higher. So all the nitrogen you measure in the product is even higher. 
you see the N2O emissions are higher than organic, and the overall result, so the N kilogram per hectare, is much more in conventional. Higher yields, more intensive, that is in principle a good sign for a farmer, has this impact. But organic, the N efficiency, because it's lacking, it's a deficit, we make more out of it. So the efficiency is stronger, and that is even by yield, not per hectare that this efficiency is stronger. And this is interesting from scientific point of view to find the optimized way and not the maximized way of fertilization. So why do we do this organic? Because it has a lot of deficits. It's not easy and it, of course, probably not the solution what policy, policy makers need. But when we're coming to why organic, this is the first point what I address in the high intensive agricultural areas that is not only in the Western world, it's in China as well where we have an overloading of nutrients imported from the rainforest in Brazil, who delivered this with soy or maize brought into our stables, fertilizing and feeding our livestock, fertilizing our fields as uh, waste, and at least drained into the Baltic Sea or the tape water. So a chain who produced problems here, and at least a global chain here. So all these problems like eutrophication or the problems of residuals in the uh, water at least is the challenge of the world who has decided to have less loads. It's not everywhere in the world. Most of the parts on the earth do not even measure water quality. So people and livestock drink what they like and can get. But this is an important problem. On the other side, we must say this cycle is even not good. Hungry and hard-working soils with hungry and hard-working livestock is producing a hard and hungry working man. So this cycle means very clear we need more food in the future. We need more efficiency per hectare per livestock to make unscarce resources more out of it. So organic is nice for biodiversity and some elements, but it's very clear this can't be the future. We need more yields per hectare, probably with out of the standards approaches, probably with fertilizers coming from the back. So coming to a conclusion, very often in the policy discussions are only this address. So this high input, high output agriculture, that's a target, that is a lot of farm inputs in, this is solving all the problems. But if you're coming to organic, you see that the most of the farms on the earth who have problems, small scale farming somewhere remote in Africa, Asia, South America, they are running low input, low output systems, traditional systems. Sometimes very easy to lift them up to an improved organic agriculture. Just tricks. Or you're going here medium input, medium output. This is extremely difficult. That is the topic of conventional. But here you have 75% of all farmers on the earth who at least manage 50% of the farmland on the earth that there is a big potential to improve systems always up and uh, here in this direction. So I did this for three years in Ethiopia. I came there in a hunger condition. 27% of the population is extreme hungry, that we had conditions here, that extreme good soils are there, eight tons wheat production was possible, so the conditions where farmers who were risky here, one hectare place, uh, was necessary to feed one family, so increasing the yield from two tons above. And we said we will not come with farm inputs, we are coming with organic tricks. We want to elevate from two tons to four tons and coming with instruments of organic agriculture like legumes integration. Not oxen ploughing, but mold boat ploughing. Having at least the weeds considered as animal feed so that they are stronger for ploughing or produce more. So that the final result is that this from low input, low output to a medium output was successful. Coming to my last two okay. slides, if it's fine. So when I coming with these both points, future challenges, first, organic prohibits slurry onto the field since decades. It becomes truth for all over agriculture. But it's clear we need it. It can't be always in the future from the mines in Morocco or somewhere else. We need a cycle who includes this clean nutrients from wastewater <coughs> or sewage from from humans. So the real cycle is with consumers. But it's unacceptable how we have it today. Contaminated, wasted, disposed. In Europe we're going a track that 2032 all wastewater has to be recycled. No deposits. 
And this is necessary that in organic farming we consider phosphate must come from the consumers. We want to have it clean, with all, without the risks. Last point is, this discussion we even can't ignore. You see the global discussion on the food 2100. It's a long time what we still need, but research is the first start to do it. So when we have the future challenge that is clear in Africa, so the shift from population who will not grow severely, up to 11 billion, the world can easily do. But from Asia it will shift over to Africa. And Africa will have 60% of the global population, but already today, with one-fourth of this, they face hunger and malnutrition. So this discussion is a very clear discussion of ignorance of this problem, and we started in the organic scene to address it. Coming to very simple figures here, if you see today, the world has for everyone this space per person. It's about 2,000 square meters space for everyone on the earth, uh, here uh, for, for food production. Africa is the same. But if we go future here, in let's say maximum, uh, maximum or medium case of the United Nations, we have space left throughout Africa that is only 300 square meters. That is a home garden. The average space per person. I can't imagine how this will be possible. And even if you say, okay, you have here some agricultural areas, that is savannah. Who have been to Africa or somewhere else is savanna. You can't not just do cropping there. Or you have to do it very costly. I do not see the money there. And water is a limiting case. And when you're coming here to Asia, they will manage it. So I do not really fear about this. Even you can go down to countries like some countries will be difficult, like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, somewhere in Indonesia, but China will manage it, Korea will manage it. But the challenge is Africa. The space of 340 square meter needs to feed one person where no one on the earth is able to feed at least this one billion people who will not have enough. So last week, I still on Monday, I was in Uganda. We launched the system of organic knowledge hubs to help such four ladies here on these corners here, four ladies on an experimental field that they can manage on 280 square meters, that's the future for Uganda, to have enough food for everyone on the earth, uh, on, in this country of Uganda. 280 square meters. And that would be the African scenario, 360 here. And in the extension, in the research, in the policy, now they integrate into the advice points, urban agriculture for rural population, intensive production, using trees, using bottles, every square meter to utilize to make food, urban agriculture in rural. And on the other part, this is a chain what we assume in the future, thesis to food. Here is the production of earthworms, four dried earthworms, that's the amount of uh, human feces you need with some straw to produce such amount of dried earthworms. Here they do some drugs like lysine, they are very rich in lysine. And here is the trading experts going to the farmers and tell them, this is a toilet, here is their feces in your toilet, use earthworms, and these earthworms will produce food or feed. First is feed for chicken, because even Africans do not like these earthworms, actually. But in principle, that is high protein quality coming out of this, at least, the feces food cycle. And on the other side here, that is the soldier, black soldier fly larvae. They even utilize bio-waste coming out of the household. Majority of this is feces. And to producing this high protein, even today, for feed, for example, for tilapia production here, and future is even food, that this chain is a chain in a continent where we have the challenge that no one will deliver this food the people will need. And this is a change in habits, ethics, and globalization of the food chain. And it's for me always very important to see that this is not in, inspired by research. It's inspired by the belly of the people that they feel already there's a scarcity. We have to cope with it. Even it's not today's a problem. But if we would ignore it, it would be a big mistake of research that there are needed of a need of questions thinking out of the box. In organic we did, because we have deficits. And I would like to ask you, every one of you, coming to a point, think about your contribution to solve the future. Oh, 
No, it's good. It's a good picture. Thank you very much. I thank you very much that I had the chance and deliver enough space for Ulrich Köpke to make a real plan, nutrition, scientific speech here with all the elements and blah, blah, what we have. I appreciate it a lot. That is nice. But do not forget, it's a system approach. You must fit into a system of future challenges. We do it already. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, perhaps um, uh, short, we might have uh, two short questions. Okay. Anyone? Okay, please. You as a chair. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Um, given that uh, water is a very scarce uh, resource today, uh, we wish, usually tend to measure the water use efficiency between uh, systems. Um, so I wonder how the organic farming can help to sustain and keep the sustainability of this resource, yep. water, yep. and the water, use, the water use efficiency between conventional and organic farming. Yep. I think it's one advantage, but I would like to hear much from you about this topic. For us in the southern countries, it's very important. Definitely. Not only for you, it's even for us very important. One question or two, or how many would you collect? It's okay, two, two, one more. <laughs> one more? One more. Thank you very much for these two questions. Coming to the first one, water, let's say water efficiency and water protection. Both are important. First is the quantity and the second one is the quality. We have in both extreme problems regional, can be big areas. In the urban areas where you have a lot of contaminations or you're coming to areas where you have a changing of rainfalls or never the right time. I've never met a farmer on the earth and I meet every year 50 somewhere, never have a talk that rainfall is good. Never. It's always wrong, and I would say a farmer is sick if we would not address it. But on the other side, we need the water efficiency is extremely important, that we at least use every drop professional for a good output, so water quantity in relation to food output. In organics, there are some simple tricks already invented where soil fertility drying out is with milking. The smaller as you come, milking system can deliver a lot. Then you have the systems of the agro Silver pastoral, it's not the challenge, it is the solutions for all problems. So we have problems definitely with these systems, permaculture or something like that. But water is an important aspect to keep it ready for any time you need cultivation. So this would be an extra speech. Now it was the nutrient issues to put it into the context of a system. But nutrients without a water answer or an ethical answer or a biodiversity answer or so would be nonsense. So it must be clear that organic is addressing this more. I can give you examples in the deserts where they have certified organic farms with 6,000 liters of water to make one liter of milk. And you have drainage in the soils to the fields of one kilometer where you have 99% losses of fossil water to fertilize or to at least irrigate maize. Maize in ridges, on the top of ridges and not in the valley of the ridges. So this is nonsense. Organic has never had this problem in the past where the standards were defined because desert areas or dry areas were not part of the decisions. So that's our role, to put water into a one of the criteria of standards, not in the principles. They are written. There is more written the cleanness, clean water. Do not contaminate. Contaminate with X, Y, Z from consumers, from public area, from farming. So this was the European-US 
question. Do not contaminate water to at least avoid uh, 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 this in the food chain, or at least in the nature. This is very clear. We must have more addressing to the sustainability questions into organic and not to deliver just a standard what is not flexible enough to have a real future option. So we must open the box. In organic movement, we did it. That is where I'm intervented. We called it organic 3.0. Open your mind. Be easy. Take others as friends. In some areas, I would even recommend 25 kilograms of nitrogen coming from Harbour Bosch. It's not bad because there's not enough biomass available to manage it in compost approaches, or you have no livestock. Coming to the livestock question, we must design systems stable without ruminants. In, in areas where ruminants are difficult, yeah, the ruminants are not able to be fed in areas like Africa, and in some societies like here in Europe, we see a big trend away from livestock. So if an organic system needs livestock like ruminants, <clears throat> we have a non-long-running system. We have just exceptions. Nowadays, it's a mobilization of nutrients from one field to the other. Biofermentation is a good trick for this. I even did this in Ethiopia with small digesters of one cubic meter, so to digest every farm residuals to have at least uh, gas for burning and not manure burning or biomass burning. So there are enough techniques on the earth but we need to compile it in a system like car manufacturing. Put things together and make it clever. 